um, part two of how we got our Bible. It's a very interesting study. I think you might find it um, helpful to find out what do you know about how do we get this book that is in our hands. And how important is it for us to know how we got that book that's in our hands? What is the value of this book? And believe you me, it's the value of our life. We talked in the first part of it, of the very fact that Islam is going to give us, as people of the book, give us a choice. But they, first of all, give us a choice to either convert to Islam or be enslaved. The second choice would be to pay a jizya tax, and that way we could keep our own faith. And the last choice would be to be executed. Be had choice. Carter? Will it? Yeah, and that was what uh, Glenn brought up last week. The, the fourth choice is avoid all the preceding and use a bullet to stop, to stop them. But as to how successful we will be on that, uh, I don't know. But you know, to those who will die by the sword, or live by the sword, they'll buy the, die by the sword, um, there's a tra chance there that you're going to die anyway. So no matter what, the question is, is this book of sufficient value to you that you're going to be willing to die because of the words within that book? That's very important. That's the crucial question that we have. Uh, Dave, uh, this thing keeps doing it every Shabbat. I think it's just trying to test me. There we go. Okay, we're going to first of all talk about the nature of the Bible. What is the nature of this book that we have in our hands? Is it just another book like Homer's Iliad? Is it just another book like uh, uh, Samuel Clemens writes? Is it just a human book? Or is there something more to it than that? So here's what we're going to try to answer in this course of study, which is going to take a period of a few weeks, a few spots. First of all, the nature of the Bible. Then where did our Bible come from? We're going to look at how good are the texts. Can we rely that the texts that we have in our hands in the original languages are the same as the autograph? We're going to examine how is it that there was the transmission from an earlier version or from the autograph into the later translations or text. Not translations, but the later text. How do we know that the Bible is really the Word of God? We're going to examine a lot more than just superficial evidence. We're going to go down into a little bit of depth on that. Why do we believe that the Bible's origin is supernatural? We're going to talk about prophetic events and the odds that are stacked up against biblical prophecy or any prophecy coming back, coming about. And we're going to look at some of these prophecies in the Bible to see how impossible it would be if it were a human book to be able to predict these things to happen. How accurate are our translations? I think uh, Bonnie asked that question a few Shabbats ago, did you not? How do we know what version of the Bible is the most accurate? Good question. And my answer was what? It's not your translation that's going to be the most accurate. It's going to be the original language that you're going to find the greatest accuracy. So you've got a choice. You can either trust somebody else's translation, and as I've said many times earlier, any translation from any language to any other language is imperfect, even from English to English, because our language, our meanings of our words have changed. So how accurate are the translations? It all depends. What are you looking for in the translation? Personally, I have the New American Standard because I look at a word-for-word -word translation. However, if you go to the New International Version, you're going to get sort of a paragraph-by-paragraph paragraph understanding of Scripture. So it's what are, what's the emphasis of the translator? But there's no perfect translation. And then look at what version is the best. If you're going to go for something, like I said, if I wanted a word-for-word -word translation, I will go to the New American Standard. This complete Jewish Bible is based on another translation, and it's not the best translation. However, the thing that's advantageous to us in the complete Jewish Bible by Stern is, number one, it's good in a synagogue setting because it keeps us abreast of the Torah portion. 
What is the name of the Torah portion? Where is the Torah portion? And Dr. Stern also provides for us the Haftorah and the New Testament suggestion. Now, the Haftorah is not a suggestion. It's what is done in the synagogue, the traditional synagogue. That's where we get the Haftorah reading. But the Brit Hadashah reading, I can choose any Brit Hadashah scripture that I want to. But I usually go along with what Dr. Stern says. First of all, the word Bible. Where in the world does that come from? Well, the word Bible comes from the Greek word biblos. It means papyrus plant. Now, one of the most interesting things that you will find is we do not have an autograph of any New Testament. None. Autograph means that which was penned by the original writer under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. None. We have not even a complete fragment of that. What do we have? Well, we have a lot of different fragments and very few complete texts which are from later periods. Well, why is that? It's because of the nature of paper. How long will this book last, given the elements? Not that long. And back in the day when I was younger, we had acid-based paper, and that it, it existed even less time. So is it going to degrade fast? And eventually, all the books in every one of the libraries of the world are going to degrade. So the same thing happened with the papyrus of the New Testament. So we do not have an autograph, but we have plenty of fragments. We have plenty of citations from early church fathers where they cited these autograph writings. So we have a lot that we can base it upon. Now, how is it on the Old Testament, on the Hebrew Scriptures? Well, if you know the nature, and we're going to come back to this, if you know the nature of how a scroll is created, even at this very day, if you knew how the soferim, the writers, the scroll people, wrote down every single letter from every single book of the, uh, the Kumash, that's the five books of Moses, if you knew how that was done and the reverence that was taken, and how they actually counted letters from the preceding one, they're actually taking and looking at a preceding scroll and writing from that and actually counting exact letters. How accurate is it? Well, to this very day, the Sopari, the ones that are, you know, copying the scriptures onto scrolls are doing it with the same accuracy that we found within the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's pretty accurate over the centuries, over the millennia, I should say. So by knowing that, you're going to have much more confidence in the fact, here's how we know that the scripture in the Greek, the original Greek, and the original Hebrew is accurate. So we'll get back to that later. But the nature of paper is eventually it'll de decay, degrade, decay, and then eventually go into fragments. That's the way it is. Why were the uh, Hebrew scriptures written on scrolls of animal skin, of lamb skin? Why? Because it lasted longer. And we still have, within the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have them. That's over 2,000 some years. That's pretty good. And that's what I'm trying to say. We have accurate Hebrew from the Hebrew uh, scriptures, and we have enough fragments, and we have enough portions of books, enough citations from the early church fathers and others, and into the various translations of it to go back and say, our New Testament is accurate to the original autograph. So that is why we have the word Biblos. Bible. Now let's look at the nature of the Bible. And by the way, I send this to you in an email. If I have your email address, I send this to you every week. However, with a caveat, I make changes during the week. And, and sometimes you don't send it. I did. I did. Serious. Lynn, did you get it? Where's Lynn? Is Lynn here? Uh -oh. Well, if you didn't get it by, by Wednesday, email me and let me know I didn't get it because I try to send them to people. When it leaves my computer and goes into the cloud, I have no control over that. <laughs> tell you what though, since I made so many changes from this, from the one I send, it doesn't make any difference. Please, I'll send you the copy and if you don't get it by Wednesday of today's, let me know. 
Okay, in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, Paul, Shaul tells us, all scripture is God-breathed. In other words, it's inspired. God breathed on it. Now, there was another time using a remus that God did a breath on somebody. Did he not? He did it on who? Adam, Adam. So he took that lifeless lump of clay from the red clay and breathed himself into it. You see, God breathed into mankind himself. And God breathes into his word, and it's a part of him. It's a part of who he is. All scripture. Now, what scripture is Shoal talking about right here? The New Testament? No, there was no such thing as a New Testament yet. We're only dealing with the Tanakh, the older covenant. That's it. We're dealing with the Hebrew scriptures. That's it. We're not dealing with the New Testament. However, following that pattern, if God breathes his word into the Tanakh, can he also breathe his word into the Brit Hadashah? The answer is absolutely, and he does. We can see God's inspiration in all of the scripture. It's valuable for teaching the truth. If you want to know the truth in your life, remember I said a few Shabbats ago, Scripture judges us. We don't judge the Scripture. Scripture judges us. So the Scripture tells us the truth. What does the Scripture tell us the truth about ourselves? In the prophet Jeremiah, he says, the heart is deceitfully wicked. So where are we in this whole thing? If it's up to our hearts, in my heart I know such a thing is right. You know what? That doesn't mean anything. If you were listening to some of the gay agenda speakers talking about things, it's in their heart that they love this man, you know, another man, or this woman, another woman. It's in their heart. So if it's in my heart as love, it's got to be right, doesn't it? No, because the heart is deceptively wicked. We can deceive ourselves. So however are we going to learn the truth about ourselves? How are we going to know what is sin and what is not sin? How are we going to know the difference between holy and not holy? Well, it's the Word of God, the Scripture that teaches us the truth. And hopefully when brought face to face with the truth that we are sinning, that we are sinners, that it will convict us of that sin. In other words, it's going to go ahead and say to us, it's going to say, you're a sinner. You see, I sin. I do. I honestly tell you, I do. And if we're all honest with each other, we should all be honest and say we all sin. Because the scripture says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And John goes on to say that if we say we have no sin, we are what? What? Liars. We are liars. And who are we making out to be a liar? We're making God out to be a liar. So if this book is not absolute truth in our lives, if we don't have the faith that this is the Word of God speaking authoritatively into our lives, then it becomes this opinion of this book as opposed to what's going on in my heart and how I feel. That leads us astray. We need to say, this book has authority, and when it speaks the truth, it needs to convict us of sin, if we are indeed sinning according to its word, to correct our faults and to train us in right living. In other words, the Bible wants us to make teshuvah, to repent, to turn from our sins, as the Bible will tell us what is sin, to turn from our sins and turn back to God. But the only way we can do that is to repent of our sin and then confess our sins to him ask his forgiveness, and you know the scripture says that he's faithful and just to forgive us. Thus anyone who belongs to God may be fully equipped for every good work. What God wants us to do is to do the work of the kingdom. Peter also writes in 2 Peter chapter 1, 20 and 21. First of all, understand this, no prophecy of scripture, and once again we're talking about the Tanakh, no New Testament. The New Testament is just now being written. But no New Testament has been canonized. We're going to get to that in a moment. But no New Testament scripture has yet been canonized to speak of the New Testament. However, because the New Testament writings are God-breathed, 
coming from God to speak to us, this is also extended then toward the New Testament scripture. And it's not to be interpreted by an individual on his own. For never has a prophecy come as a result of human will. On the contrary, people moved by the rock Hakodesh spoke a message from God. In other words, it's the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that caused the message to come in the first place. Now, let's just say this. If we take the Pauline epistles that some say Paul is saying, that Paul is speaking against the Torah, if we do that, then Paul is a false prophet, or Paul is a false teacher. Now, that's how the church at large pretty well handles Paul. Paul is an antinomian. He's against the Torah. He's against the law. And so, if that were the case, and if Paul is a false apostle or a false prophet, then none of his books should be in this book. None of them. None of the epistles. However, let's just say for the sake of argument, Paul is not a false prophet or a false apostle. I believe that. All his books then that we find in his epistles are then inspired and they're scripture. As Peter will talk about. We'll talk about that a little bit later. In 2 Peter chapter 3, if you want to read ahead sometime. So here, if indeed it is the Holy Spirit that's causing Paul to write these what seems to be antinomian or anti-law, we've got a problem with the Holy Spirit. Now there's the Father, there's the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now all three are supposed to be one, aren't they? One God. But if the Holy Spirit is writing through Paul anti-law stuff, then the Holy Spirit has a problem with the Father and the Son, does he not? Because both of them seem to be for the uh, keeping by commandments. Either be the Father or the Holy or Yeshua speaking from the Tanakh or in the New Testament. What does he say often? He says, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. Hey, that seems to be a theme, both in the Tanakh as well as in the New Testament writings. So now, if indeed the Holy Spirit were against the law, writing through Paul, why are those seemingly anti-law things in there? If they're one, they shouldn't be. So therefore, it goes back, maybe I'll just take you to that scripture anyway. Go with me to 2 Peter chapter 3. Might as well. 2 Peter 3. Begin in verse number 15. 2 Peter 3.15. And think of our Lord's patience as deliverance, just as our dear brother Shaul, that's Paul, also wrote you, following the wisdom God gave him. Indeed, he speaks about these things in all his letters. They contain some things that are hard to understand. Now listen to the rest of this. Things which the uninstructed and unstable do what? Distort or twist to their own destruction as they do what? the other scripture. In other words, what Peter is doing here is equating the level of false writing along with the rest of scripture, all the other scriptures, and he's equating it with equality to that. But he's also saying that there are people that twist Paul. Well, they did that before, if you remember when he comes back in Acts 21 from his third and final missionary journey. He comes back and he's being confronted by James. James says that there are myriads of Jewish believers who are zealous for the Torah that have heard that you are here. Go to Acts 21, 21. It says, now if what they've been told about you is that you're teaching all the Jews living among the Goyim to apostatize from Moses. In other words, to do away with the law telling them not to have written law, that circumcision for their sons, and not to follow the traditions. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you've come. So do this that we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take them with you, be purified with them, and pay the expenses connected with having their heads shaved. Then everyone will know that there's nothing to these rumors. In other words, those twisted words that others were saying about Paul, 
What Paul is to do is to do the Nazarite vow to show that those are not what he's doing. That's not what he's doing. But on the contrary, you yourself stay in line and what? Keep the Torah. So what do we have here? We have people twisting Paul. And that's what's happening in the church today when they say, well, you're not under the law, you're under grace. Well, that's a twist. But I'm not going to get into that. I've thought on it many, 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 many times over the last few years, right? So that's not what I'm going to get into. However, if the Holy Spirit had a problem with the Father and the Son about the law, why didn't he just simply say, no, I'm not going to put that in there? He could have. He's God, too. No, I will not put that in there, right? So if Paul is really against the Torah, as some say that he is, the Holy Spirit, hey, he's one-third of the equation. That's not what he did. The words are in there. So now what are we going to do with them? We better interpret them correctly. Now let's get into the definition of inspiration. You know, I just... I just inspired... Now I expire. Not now, permanently. <laughs> inspire. Expire. Inspire. Expire. You know what inspire is? In brief. You know what the expire is? Not, not the death part of it. To breathe out. Now, if men are being inspired by the Holy Spirit, what is the Holy Spirit doing to them? In breathing. Just like God breathed into Adam, just like God breathes into his word. He's breathing in to those who are writing down the scripture. Now, the definition of inspiration, the act of the Holy Spirit in which he superintended, how did he do that? The writers of scripture, so that while writing according to their own styles and personalities, they produce God's word, written, authoritative, and free from error in the original writings. Now, where did I get that? Well, I got it from the Moody Handbook of Theology, page 638, written by Paul Innes. Thought it was a very good quote. Now, there are two implications of inspiration. How did he do that? Well, first, let's realize that the Bible is a human book. That authors use their own language, writing methods, style of writing, and literary form of writing. They used what they had at the time that they wrote. These authors wrote to a specific audience in a specific historical context, written for a specific purpose. Now, when we were teaching our biblical hermeneutic, we were saying, what we're seeing here is written to a specific group of people in a specific time frame. So, you know, sometimes it's confusing to us here in the United States a few thousand years later. Why is that? Well, it's because we're not in that time frame. How are we going to understand it then? Well, we have to somehow have to go back to that time frame, back to the historical and the chronological context. We have to go back to where are they coming from? Or you won't understand it. The Bible is influenced by a culture to which the author wrote. Now, he's louder than I am. <laughs> so the culture in which the author wrote. And then realize this. The Bible has over 40 authors which was written over a period of time of 1,500 years. Now, so the Bible is a human book, but it's also a divine book. The Bible is inerrant. Inher the Bible is authoritative. It has authority over God's people. By the way, even though the Bible has authority over God's people, others will be judged by the words of the Bible, even if they're not God's people. And that we realize then from Timothy, so if you go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1, you're going to see where Paul is writing to Timothy. In 1 Timothy 1 verse 8, we know that the Torah is good, provided one uses it in a way that the Torah itself intends. Now listen to this part. We are aware that Torah is not for a person who is righteous, you think it was all for us? Well, if we're walking righteously after the righteous one, the Tzadi, Messiah Yeshua, we're just following him. But for those who are heedless of the Torah, and rebellious, ungodly, and sinful, wicked and worldly, for people who kill the fathers and mothers, for murders, the sexually immoral, both heterosexual and homosexual, 
slave dealers, liars, perjurers, and anyone who acts contrary to sound teaching that accords with the good news of the glorious and blessed God. So those who are not walking by Torah today, and we're talking about mankind as a whole, are going to be judged by Torah one day. Well, when are they going to be judged by Torah? Well, go with me to Revelation chapter 20. In Revelation chapter 20, we see that after the 1,000 year reign of our Messiah, in beginning in verse 11, there's a great white throne judgment, and one sitting on it. Earth and heaven fled from his presence, and no, one, no place was found for them. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing in front of the throne. Books were opened, and another book was opened, the book of life, and the dead were judged from what was written in the books according to what they had done. You see, anyone who's not found in the book of life, the Lamb's book of life, are going to go to the hot place for eternity. But they're going to be judged according to the righteousness of the book. The laws apply to them, whether they're righteous or unrighteous. Just like the laws apply to us, if we should go out and start speeding, and we get pulled over by the police officer, we can't just defend ourselves and say, well, that doesn't apply to me. No, you're going to get the ticket anyway. See, there's an authority. So it will apply to you. So the authority of the Bible speaks to all of us. Now, the Bible, though it has 66 books, 40 authors, and goes over a span of 1,500 years, it has a consistent message. It's unity. And it compared with itself for proper interpretation. We'll get more into that later. The Bible has an element of mystery. Some passages may be hard to understand, especially Paul. And then finally, the Bible has an interpretation to it that's intended by God. But where does the interpretation come from? From the who? The Holy Spirit. Now, when we say inerrant, we're speaking to this first. The Bible is inerrant. What does that mean? Well, inerrancy teaches that since the scriptures are given by God, that they are free from error in all their contents, including doctrines, history, science, geography, and other branches of knowledge. Again, by Paul Enns, the Moody Handbook of Theology. So when we say they're inerrant, we're saying they're coming from one who is without error, and that's God himself. So in doctrines, in history, in science, geography, and other branches of knowledge, they're inerrant. You know, there historically have been people that said, well, there's no group of people called the Assyrians. That is until archaeology got around to prove that there was a group of people called the Assyrians. So when we look at some parts of the scripture that speak about the orbs of planets and stars, the orbs, you know, the round things that are in the air, that are in the sky and the heavens, did you know at one time that the church didn't accept that? But there it is in the Bible. So the Bible speaks to something. And by the way, the Bible speaks to the fact that the earth is not the center of the universe. It took a while for the church to come to it, and a few people uh, who proclaim that were regarded as heretics. So the thing is, later on, science proved what the Bible said, oftentimes not to admit it. Let's talk about inspiration for a moment. How was that accomplished? There are three basic approaches to inspiration. You may hold any one or all of them. But when you go to the evangelical approach, the first one is dictation theory. It said that God dictated the books of the Bible word by word as if the biblical authors were dictating machines. Now there might be some uh, credence to that whole thing. And when we get into the inspiration of the Bible into more detail of the text, if you start, and Missler brought this up, Dr. Chuck Missler did, and I'll bring that back into the study, because we talked about way back in hermeneutics, that when you're dealing with the first few books of the Bible, that you can find the word Torah facing toward the book of Leviticus. When you go to Deuteronomy and Numbers and look backwards, you can find Torah in reverse pointing to the book of Leviticus. And we'll get into that, that's equidistant letter. But how in the world did a human writer writing all these things in, in the Hebrew language, how did Moses know how to put at equidistant, in other words, at equal distance, each of these letters to spell Torah in the Genesis and Exodus and uh, you know, pointing toward Leviticus, and then in the back, away from 
Deuteronomy and Numbers pointing backwards toward Leviticus, unless you had a computer doing it. Well, that's the only way it could be done in the human sense. So now you've got letter by letter in Genesis and Exodus pointing toward, toward Leviticus, and letter by letter in Deuteronomy and Numbers pointing backwards toward Leviticus. Can a human do that? Well, that kind of lends itself to this concept of dictation. However, I think it's a lot more than just dictation. The second one is known as verbal plenary inspiration. And that view gives a greater role to the human. Here, there's no role. The human must have just been the one that dictated, took by dictation like a secretary would, and dictated, took the dictation from God. Here, in the verbal plenary inspiration, it gives a greater road to human writers while maintaining a belief that God preserved the integrity of the words of the Bible. And the effect of inspiration was to move the author so as to produce the words God wanted. And this is really interesting because you're going to find within the different writers of Scripture, you're going to find different personalities being brought out. Paul has his personality. Luke has his personality. Peter has his own personality. John has his personality. All these writers have their own personalities, and yet they're being influenced by the Holy Spirit to put down what God wants them to do. So God providentially prepares these instruments, these people, to produce scripture. And the final one is dynamic inspiration. The thoughts contained in the Bible are inspired, but the words used were left to the individual writers. Well, overall, I would say that would be true, except that when you find it, that what Chuck Mitchell brought in about equidistant lettering and stuff, you're going to find things in Scripture in Isaiah and other writings that have the, if you will, the watermark of the patience of that Scripture that show God's um, author. Yeah. So we're going to move on from there because sometimes it gets kind of boring getting into the real depth. And let's move on. We talked about this just again as a reminder. The scripture that we're talking about here is the Tanakh. We're not talking about the Greek and Hadashah yet. However, by extension, it will be doing that. How do I know that they were talking about the Hebrew scriptures of the Tanakh? Well, again, Paul writes to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.14. He says to Timothy, continue in what you've learned and have become convinced of, recalling the people, that is, mom and his grandmother, from whom you learned it. His dad was a Gentile. And recalling, too, how from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which can give you the wisdom that leads to deliverance through trust in Yeshua, the Messiah. Now, if you didn't have a single letter of New Testament, could you be saved by the Tanakh? The answer is, Paul says, yes. It's the Tanakh that Timothy had and that he learned from childhood. The Tanakh can give you the wisdom that leads to deliverance or salvation through faith in Yeshua. Because the Tanakh talks about Yeshua. All the scripture. The Tanakh points forward to Yeshua and the Greek Hadashah points backwards to Yeshua. It's all about Yeshua. Can the Tanakh save you? Well, what did the body of Messiah have before the Greek Hadashah was canonized? All they had was the Tanakh. So what do we have to look at? Well, we have to say, obviously, the Tanakh can, the words of the Tanakh will save you. So we're only talking about the Hebrew scriptures then. Now, that is what can lead people to salvation. Now, if you don't believe in Paul, and if you don't believe in any of the other New Testament scriptures, just believe in the Tanakh. The Tanakh talks about Yeshua, and the Tanakh can lead you to Yeshua. But I'm certainly hopeful that all of us will believe in the whole Word of God. Remember this, that the New Testament writings were not canonized until the 4th century. That's in the 300s. So what led people to salvation before that? Of course, the Tanakh. Tanakh is an acronym. T of Tanakh means Torah or Moses, the first five books. Now the E starts with Joshua and goes all the way to Malachi, the, the prophets. And that's where we get our hot Torah readings from. The hot Torah readings are from the prophets, which will be somewhere between Joshua, including Joshua, and Malachi. 
And then finally, the Ketuvim or the writing, that takes you from the Psalms to the Second Chronicles. In the Hebrew Scripture, Second Chronicles is the last book of the Hebrew Scriptures. In the Christian Scriptures, the last book of the Hebrew Scriptures is Malachi. The next question we ask, where did our Bibles come from? Here we're getting into canonization. How in the world did people, did men pick the books that had to be incorporated, that were incorporated into this Bible? How did they pick them? Was it strictly random? They had their eyes shut, they drew lots. What did they do? There was a method. There was a reasoning behind that. And we need to know what it is. Canon means read or straight rod, i.e. it's a standard. Now, at home, I have a certain standard when I want to be able to measure how long a piece of wood is. I have a tape measure. Now, my tape measure is a standard, and I'm assuming that when my tape measure says one foot, that when I go over to Jason's house, and you have a tape measure, I'm sure, Jason opens his up to one foot, I am assuming that both of our tape measures are saying the same thing. So if I went over to your place, David, and opened up yours, it would say have 12 inches being exactly the same as mine and Jason's. And the same thing going over to your place. I mean, if I went over to any of your places and you have a tape measure, I am assuming that all of our feet look the same. <laughs> That's a standard, or a candle, or a straight line. Now the Hebrew scriptures, the Tanakh, were compiled in their present form about 450 BC. That's 450 years before the time of Messiah. That's important to know. Because you will have people today saying, well, obviously, because of the prophetic words of Daniel. Now, Daniel's not found in the prophets, interestingly enough. He's found in the writings. But because of the prophetic words of Daniel, Daniel must have been attended to much, much later than what is being attributed in other words, somebody later added these words to show fulfillment. Now people are going to say anything. People are going to say New Testament books were not written at the same time as most scholars say that they were. Now, anybody can say anything. Now the thing is, is it true or not true? Well, let's just talk about the truth of the Tanakh right now. The Tanakh was canonized about 450, excuse me. It was written, compiled, put together in the present form about 450 BC. Then it was canonized about 200 BC, 200 years before the Messiah. In other words, it became the standard of what is regarded as scripture about 200 years before that. Now, how do I know that? One of the ways to know it is by the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were mostly written on part parchment stored in the Qumran area in caverns and very well preserved. In fact, if you go to Israel today, there is a, uh, a building that you could go in. It's a round building. I can't remember the, what the word you know, that the was called. Shrine of the Book? Shrine of the Book. Thank you. They're there. They're from the Dead Sea, and they validate the scripture that we have in our hands today, if it's not. So it's a really important thing to know the Dead Sea Scrolls prove that what we have in our hands is correct. Now Josephus also. Now Josephus Flavius was a Jewish general. He was captured and he went on over to the Romans and became a historian. Now Josephus supports the Protestant view. Why I say Protestant is because the Catholic and the Protestants have a disagreement over what the Old Testament is in Canada. But Josephus supports the Protestant view of the canon of the Old Testament against the Roman Catholic view, which we're going to talk about much later, which venerates the Old Testament Apocrypha. Apocrypha means that which is in addition to, you know, books that were written in addition to what was part of the Tanakh. In other words, you've got Bell and the Dragon, you've got Maccabees, Maccabees, first and second Maccabees, which we use at Hanukkah and talk about, they're not, they're not uh, canonized. 
by Judaism. They're not canonized by the Protestants, but they are canonized by the Catholics. And you've got others, Esdras and other writings that are known as Apocrypha. But Josephus lists the names of the books and they are identical with the names of the 39 books of the Protestant Old Testament. So if you have a Protestant Bible, you will find that there are 39 books in the Old Testament. The book, the complete Jewish Bible, does not have Esdras, it does not have Bill and the Dragon, it does not have 1st and 2nd Maccabees and some of the other ones. So what is Dr. Stern following after? The 39 books of the Protestant, what we would see in a Protestant Bible, but which is found in Judaism. Judaism came long before there were Protestants and Catholics. You'll find this in new evidence that demands a verdict page 56. I would strongly recommend, here's another book thing, that if you don't have volumes one and two of evidence that demands a verdict by, Dr. Dr. by Josh McGowell, then it would be a good idea for you to get it because it gives you a lot of good information. Another book that I'm going to be citing in a moment here, another book is the um, Erdman's Handbook to the History of Christianity. It's a good historical book that would help us. Now, the approximate dates of the Hebrew Scriptures, I'm not going to go through every one of them. However, just realize this, that nobody knows when the book of Job was written. But as far as going through at least the, uh, the Torah, Genesis of Rashid was written 1445 to 1405. Those are approximate dates. Exodus Shmo, 1445 to 1405. Um, Leviticus, uh, Beta Krah, 1445 to 1405. David Bar, Numbers, 1445 to 1405. And Devarim, Deuteronomy, 1445 to 1405. Why were they written at the same time? Because Moses is a long road. So we've got this in the time frame of when Moses would have been writing down the Torah. I'm not going to go through every one of this, no need to. However, the thing that we need to know is this. Yeshua upheld all the Tanakh. Well, of course, the Tanakh was canonized 200 years, 250, 200 years before he existed uh, in the flesh, I should say, before he walked this earth in the flesh. He just long before there was even a earth. So he upheld all the words of the Tanakh. If you go to Luke 24, 27, after his death and resurrection, with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, it says, starting with Moses and the pro all the prophets. Now that means Torah and the Nevi'im. Torah is Moses, another way to say law, or, or Moses uh, is law or Torah, and Nevi'im or the prophets. You know right here that he affirms Moses, the Torah, and the prophets. And it says he explained to them the things that can be found throughout the Tanakh. That's throughout the entire scripture of the, what we would call the Hebrew scripture of the Old Testament concerning himself. And then in Luke 24, in the upper room, with his disciples, Yeshua said to them, this is what I meant when I was still with you and told you that everything written about me in the Torah of Moses that's the T part of Tanakh. The prophets, that's the end, the Nevi'im. And the Psalms, that's the Ketuvim, had to be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the Tanakh. That means the entire Old Testament. So he affirms the entire Old Testament. Now, you have a group of Jews out there that do not uh, carry out you. They do not affirm either the prophets or the writings. All they say is just the Torah, just the Torah, just the Torah. The prophets and the writings, no. We don't believe in the inspiration of the prophets or the writings. Well, it's your thing. So if once a Karaite Jew, and I knew a Karaite Jew, he was one in my last class in uh, Biblical Hebrew, Olive, and he didn't believe in the prophets or the writings, he just believed in the Torah. But if he became a believer in Yeshua, he'd have to believe in not only Moses, that is the Torah, but also he'd have to believe in the prophets and the writings. Because that's what Yeshua, if he becomes a believer in Yeshua, that's what the Master believed. So Yeshua believed, as Matthew chapter 5, 17 says, don't think that I've come to abolish the Torah, that's Moses, or the prophets. 
I came not to abolish, but to complete. Now, that's also translated as fulfill. We've talked about that in biblical hermeneutics before. And what complete or fulfill means is to, trans to interpret correctly. To abolish means to interpret incorrectly. That's what it means in the vernacular of the first century rabbi. So what Yeshua is doing is a servant, is um, saying that the Torah and the prophets are scripture, and he did not come to do away with it. Yeshua then believed in the entire Tanakh, or the entire Old Testament. Now let's talk about the New Testament writings now. So canonization, what about the New Testament, or also known as the apostolic writings? Well, it isn't completed as canon until the 14th, or excuse me, the 4th century. That's in the 300s. What it was, was a collection of writings that met a prescribed standard. And we need to look at the standard. How did these books that we have in our Bibles get interpreted as being scripture? What was the criteria that met the standard to have them incorporated in the Word? From Erdman's handbook, that's the book that I have on the top, to the history of Christianity. On page 94 it says, different parts of the New Testament were written by this time, but not yet collected as, or defined as scripture. Now early Christian writers, for example, Polycarp and Ignatius, quote from the Gospels and Paul's letters, as well as from other Christian writing and oral sources. Paul's letters were collected late in the first century, that's when they were collected. When did Paul die? Anybody know? When was he martyred? By Nero. Well, we know when Nero died. He died in 65 to 67 AD. So what we're looking at here is Paul wrote, as we see here, to the Romans, to the Corinthians, to the Galatians, to the Ephesians, to the Colossians, to the Philippians, to the Thessalonians, he wrote to Timothy, he wrote all these to specific people, groups, or people. What did these Thessalonians do with the letters that were written to them? Copied them. What? Copied them down. He copied them, they copied them down. They collected them, in other words, they realized that these were special writings and they copied them down so that they could be cast off. Now one of the reasons for the copying down is because early Christianity and Christianity even today is a missionary group. In other words, you're not keeping the word just to yourself. You want to make copies of that. That's what's going on in some parts of the world today. Uh, somebody might have a Bible and what are other people doing? They're copying them down in their own languages and they're copying down so that they can have a copy. Well, that showed some kind of authority within their collection and keeping and passing it on. So we need to see here that there were reasons for having these books. And if indeed Paul is not an apostle or one speaking with authority, you know, I got, I got, I'll confess something to you. I've had prophets, you know, they're prophets. I will tell you. Prophets write to me and say, thus saith the Lord in all sorts of astounding things. Now, number one, some of these astounding things, most of them never came to pass. But even if some came to pass, that doesn't prove that they're a prophet or not. There is a criteria to determine who's a prophet of God or not. Oh well, yeah, they are a prophet. I need to say there are such things as false prophets. And may I also say, quantitatively, over the years, I have discovered this that there are many, many more false prophets than prophets of God. So what is it that I do, I'm confessing now, what is it that I do with a false prophet or a false apostles writing to me? You see that circular file over there? I have one at home. I get those letters from these prophets. And you know where the writings go? Do you know where it goes from my home, circular file? It goes up to the junkyard. I don't keep them. I don't collect them. I don't make copies of them. I don't want them. 
So the thing is, if indeed the Corinthians regarded Paul as a false apostle and a false prophet, why in the world did they keep him and copy him and pass it on to other people? Good question. You better ask yourself that to, you know, to see, okay, why did they keep him? Why did they copy him? The Thessalonians, if Paul was a false apostle and a false prophet, why did they keep him? Why did they copy him? Why didn't they use those letters to burn a nice fire at night? You see, they kept them, they collected them, they copied them. And then finally, Matthew, Mark, and Luke were brought together by about 150 AD. Now, I'm going to pass on an agenda. The first agenda. Who's my uh, pastor Albert? I've got two hand ups here. One of them is the early church recognizes the New Testament. Hey, hey, you can do this next one. Paul's epistles or letters. Now that gets rid of a whole lot of papers for me, thank you, guys. Let's start with the early church recognizes the New Testament. Now, by the way, the New Testament of the early church is not the New Testament that we have in our Bibles today. Very interesting. Different progression. On the left-hand column, from top to bottom, AD 200. By the way, I need to note this is prior to the Council of Nicaea, which was in 325. Why do I say that? I say that because these books were considered part of the scripture long before the Catholic Church at Nicaea defined what scripture was or not. There are some people that think that Nicaea was a conspiracy. Well, there was a conspiracy at Nicaea. One of them had to do with Passover. The other had to do with uh, who the Trinity is. Arius, also known as the Arian uh, uh, concept. But it was prior to Nicaea. So in 200 and 250, here's what the church used. The New Testament at the Church of Rome, the, you have your four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, yeah, Acts, you have Paul's letters, that is all of the Pauline epistles, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, and 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Philemon. So you've got all the Pauline epistles, therefore the churches at these locations not only received these epistles, but they collected these epistles, and they made copies of these epistles, and they were regarded as part of Scripture. James, the brother of Yeshua, wrote First and Second John, Jude, the Revelation of John, the Revelation of Peter, and Wisdom of Solomon. Now there was a book that we do not find anywhere in our uh, Bibles today. It was to be used in private but not public worship. It's called the Shepherd of Hermas. Not found in any of our works today. Now in 250, the New Testament is uh, mentioned by Origen. You have the first uh, four Gospels, Acts, all, all the Pauline epistles, 1 Peter, 1 John, and Revelation of John. Now where's the Revelation of Peter? Where's the wisdom of Solomon? Where's James? So look down below, you're going to see where it says disputed. Now, amongst the disputed writings at AD 250 were Hebrews, which we find in our Bibles today, James, which was in the 200 uh, AD church, 2 Peter, 2nd and 3rd John were disputed, Jude was disputed, the shepherd of Hermas was disputed, the letters of Barnabas was disputed, teaching of the 12 apostles was disputed, and the gospel of the Hebrews was disputed. So those were disputed writings. Now let's get into the 4th century, beginning at uh, AD 300. The New Testament used by Eusebius, which was another church leader. You had the four Gospels, you had Acts, you had all the Pauline epistles, you had 1 Peter, 1 John, and the Revelation of John. But the authorship was in doubt. Those that were disputed but well known was James, 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John, Jude. But that which was to be excluded, not which would have been disputed in the previous, was the Shepherd of Hermas, the Letter of Barnabas, the Gospel of the Hebrews, Revelation of Peter, Acts of Peter, and the Didache, which, by the way, are a group of rules. Now you go into the 5th century, which is AD 400, after the Council of Nicaea in 325, and here's what you got. It was fixed 
for the Western Church by the Council of Carthage, the four Gospels, Acts, Paul's Epistles, then the book of Hebrews, which was once disputed back in 250. Now you've got James, which was also disputed in 250. First and second Peter, first, second, third John, Jude, and Revelation. So you see, you're finally getting into the uh, canon that was fixed for the Western Church by the Council of Carthage in AD 400. That's the evolution that we find in Scripture from the early church. Now, let's look at the approximate dates of the apostolic writings according to reputable scholarship. You're going to have people out there that are going to dispute like they disputed Daniel. You're going to have people disputing the writings that are contrary to that which is uh, the writings of reputable scholarship. Here's what reputable scholarship says, that Matthew was written in 43, that James somewhere between 44 and 49, Thessalonians between 51 and 52, all these are AD. Second Thessalonians 51 to 53, Galatians 50 to 57, First Corinthians 55 to 57, Second Corinthians 55 to 58, Romans 56 to 58, Luke 60 to 61, Ephesians 60 to 62, Philippians 60 to 62, Philemon 60 to 62, Colossians 60 to 62, Acts 62, <coughs> 1 Timothy 62 to 66. 67 is when um, Paul was martyred. Titus 60, 62 to 66. Mark 64. 1 Peter 63 to 65. Why am I doing it? Because some people are not going to have these handouts and they're going to access it by the internet. So I'm doing it longhand here. Chris, Chris can you go back one page? Yeah, that's the first I'll be sending this to you in a PDF this week. Oh, thank you. <coughs> Where was I? Okay. Timothy 66 to 67, 2 Peter 65 to 68, uh, Hebrews 67 to 69. And by the way, remember Peter was martyred also in Rome, supposedly uh, crucified upside down. He was martyred after Paul. Jude 68 to 75, John 80 to 90, 1 John 90 to 95, 2 John 90 to 95, 3 John 90 to 95, and the last book is Revelation, anywhere from 94 to 97. Very important to know when, because sometimes you're going to have people disputing certain things. Some scholars will say that none of these books were written after AD 70 when the temple was destroyed. I contend that that's not true by good scholarship. Now, getting to Paul's epistles. If you go with me to the second handout, Paul's epistles are letters. It was written, and I'm not going to go through every one of these. Uh, it was written, of course, by Paul to whom? Romans to the Romans. Corinthians to the church in Corinth. Both first and second Corinthians. Galatians to Galatia. Ephesians to the church in Ephesus. And here's the outline is what is it that are the main points that Paul is writing to these people. Realize this, this is not an expository on everything that we should do as believers. Realize this, that if Paul were writing to us in our day, he'd be addressing a lot of the problems that we are facing right now. So he is writing to a specific group of people in a specific church, talking about specific problems that they have. And we need to realize that because some of these particular problems we will be experiencing and are experiencing to this very day. It tends to be that history seems to repeat itself over and over and over and over again. And we're doing that in our century now. But on the other hand, we need to realize that he's also speaking to a specific group of people with a specific group of problems, and he's addressing these problems so that they can be uh, you know, taken care of. He is not putting out a systematic theology. Now, we humans tend to want to, in Western thinking, we're in the Greek mindset, we want to systematize everything, we want to compartmentalize everything, and we want to make a system. You know why the Methodists are called Methodists? Because John Wesley had a method, a method of doing something. And what did the people want to do when they saw John Wesley? They wanted to follow his method. Well, we always wanted, as, as Greek-thinking people, 
We always want to find some kind of a method. How do we do this to make God pay more attention to us or to be more righteous in living? And I'm not saying that, you know, being more righteous in living is wrong. I'm not saying that at all. In fact, you can see the principle of cleanliness is next to godliness. It's in the scripture, but it's not found in the scripture. You know, isn't it a good idea that some of us take baths every month or two? <laughs> you know, Queen Victoria said, I take a bath once a month whether I need it or not. What? Back in those days in England, they didn't take baths very often. <laughs> So what Paul would be doing if he's writing to the church or the congregation in Priest River is he'd be addressing some of our problems. That's all he's doing here. These messages like to the Romans and the Corinthians and the Galatians and the Ephesians, they're not systematic theology. They're addressing problems for that particular church. Just like he'd be addressing problems for our group if he were alive today. So that's what this is looking at the Pauline epistles to say, here's what it is. Now we're almost done with our time for today. I want to just get through with canon. Canon refers to the closed collection. In other words, there's no new books, either in the Tanakh or in the apostolic messianic writings. No new ones. Bruce, by a thus saith the Lord, is not going to write another book of the Bible. It's not going to be. It's not going to happen. Canon means it's already established, it's there, it's our collection of what we need in our scripture. And it's divinely inspired, it's authoritative in our lives, and it speaks to our beliefs and the practices. What do we believe and how do we practice? So now we move to the question, is the Bible authoritative? Well, here are the principles of how books got put in to scripture. First of all, let's look at that of the Tanakh. What is the basic guideline for books to be found and placed in the Tanakh? I'll be honest with you. If you read some of the books, some of the writings of Jeremiah, where it likens Israel to a heifer sniffing after her male lovers, I will tell you honestly in some of the great depths of some of the words that he used, no wonder why they put them in the pit. No wonder why they didn't like Jeremiah too much. Oh, but listen to Isaiah. Some of the things Isaiah said about Israel and Judah. No wonder why they cut them asunder. You know, you could say, quite frankly, if they had their way about it, those books would not be found in this Bible of ours. They'd be swept underneath the rug someplace. And let's just ignore them, because they don't speak kindly of us. But quite frankly, by the criteria of scripture in Deuteronomy 13 and 18. That's how these books got into the Bible. The books of Moses, that's the foundation. Always go back to the foundation, which is Torah. Then you have the prophets, which are built upon the foundations of Torah. Then you have the writings that are built upon the prophets and the foundation of Torah. Let's look at Deuteronomy 13. If you have your Bibles, take them out. Deuteronomy 13, beginning in verse number 2 or 1, depending on if you have a Christian Bible or a Hebrew-based Bible. It says, if a prophet or someone who gets messages while dreaming among, rises among you, and he gives you a sign or wonder, and the sign or wonder does come about as he predicted when he said, okay, let's stop here. If a prophet gives a sign or a wonder and it comes true, does it make that a true prophet or a false prophet. Now, we've got to stop and say, honestly, it could be a true prophet. Until we get to the next part of this verse. Now, here's where the signs or wonder parts come in. Go with me to Deuter I mean, Revelation chapter 13. In Revelation chapter 13, it talks about the rise of the beast from the sea. Then it talks about the rise of the false prophet that follows after him. Now, let's talk about specifically the false prophet, as he's called. Verse 11 of Revelation 13. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns, like those of a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. Now, we know who the dragon is from Revelation 12. The dragon is who? Satan, the adversary. Now, he looks like a lamb. Who's the lamb found in the scripture? Yeshua. He looks like Yeshua. That's why... 
I speculate, and here's my opinion, and I could be wrong. This is Bruce's opinion. I think this false prophet is the Islamic Jesus, who comes following the Mahdi, who I call, look at the beast, and he goes ahead and speaks with the authority of the first beast, which is the Mahdi, the Islamic Messiah. It goes in verse number 12, then, and exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence. It makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, the one whose fatal wound was, had been healed. Now look at verse 13. It performs great miracles, even causing fire to come down from heaven onto the earth as people watch. Now which prophet caused fire to come down? It was Elijah. And it deceives the people living on the earth by the miracles it is allowed to perform in the presence of the beast. Now, do signs and wonders prove a true prophet? Absolutely not. If that prophet does something and you see a sign or wonder, it does come true. But as soon as he says, let us follow other gods which you have not known and let us serve them, you are not to listen to the, what the prophet or dreamer says. For the Lord God is testing you in order to find out whether you really do love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your being. Now, you know, the Via Hakka, we say it every Shabbat. Love him with what? But here's how you're going to know that it's another God that he's leading you to. Verse 5, you are to follow on and your God, fear him, obey his mitzvot, his commandments. Now, what is the church today basically saying? Oh, you can love him. You can love God and Jesus, but you don't have to keep his commandments. We're no longer under the law, we're under grace. Now, some false prophet at some time, and people bought into that. That's what's happened. That's wrong. So even if that prophet goes ahead and does signs or wonders, and those wonders come true, how do you know that he's leading you to a God which you've not known? Because our God says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Follow my commandments. Keep my commandments. This is what our God says over and over and over again. So if a prophet arises, does signs or wonders and says, ah, you don't have to keep these commandments of God. They're just out. It's been replaced in the New Testament by love, Jesus. Well, you know, love means keeping God's commandments. How do you keep God's commandments then? How do you love him? That's how you keep it. That's how you love him. What's going to happen to that dreamer of dreams? It's supposed to be put to death. Let's not forget Deuteronomy 18 now, because that's another side of the coin of what is a prophet. And since the criteria of putting scripture into the Hebrew scripture into the canon was based on the prophetic, then you better look at Deuteronomy 18 as well. It says, the Lord will raise up for your prophet like me from among yourselves. Now, from your own kinsmen, you are to pay attention to him. Hey, was Israel supposed to pay attention to Isaiah? Was Israel supposed to pay attention to Jeremiah? Was Israel supposed to pay attention to Malachi? Was Israel supposed to pay attention to Nehemiah? Was Israel supposed to pay attention to all these prophets? You betcha they are. Now, if there are prophets in the New Testament, and I say, yes, there are, Deuteronomy 18 says, if the Lord raises up a prophet from among yourselves, you are to pay attention to him. So if Paul is a true apostle, and if Paul is a true prophet, which I believe he is, you better pay attention to him. Because if you're not, you're in trouble. Verse 18. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their kinsmen. I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I order him. Whoever doesn't listen to my words, which he shall speak in my name, will have to account for himself to me. But if a prophet speaks presumptuously, speaks a word in my name, which I didn't order him to say, or if he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet must die. Now you may be asking or wondering, how are we to know if the word has not been spoken by the Lord? Here it is. Verse 22, when a prophet speaks in the name of Adonai and the prediction does not come true. Now that's just the opposite of what happened in Deuteronomy 13. If Deuteronomy 13, a prophet arises and he speaks something and a sign or a wonder happens and a prophetic comes true, it doesn't make him a true prophet of God. You've got to see where does he lead you to. On the other side, if God raises up a true prophet and puts his words in his mouth, you better listen to what he says. 
or you will have to account for that. Now, if that prophet, or it's a prophet speak, speaks presumptively a word in my name, which I didn't order him to say, or if he speaks in the name of other gods, how do you know if it's another god? Because what? Because he's saying, don't keep God's Torah, his commandments. That prophet must die. If that prophet or prediction does not come true, then the Lord did not speak that word. Will you give me grace for a couple minutes? Okay, here's the canonicity of the New Testament. If the canonicity of the Older Testament was prophetic origin, it was spoken by a prophet according to the criteria of Deuteronomy 13:18. then the canonicity of the New Testament was based on another but apostolic origin or association. What that consists of is the Gospels. Why? Because Mark is associated with Peter, and Luke is associated with Paul. How about the Acts? Well, Luke is associated with Paul. And the epistles, all of the epistles are either written by Paul, Peter, Jude, James, or John, and whoever the author of the book of Hebrews is. And, of course, the revelation of John. Here's what the test of the New Testament canonicity is. The basic factor for recognizing a book's canonicity for the New Testament was divine inspiration. And the chief test for this was apostolicity. In other words, being an apostle or associated with apostles. And the term apostolic, for instance, in Acts chapter 242, the church of Jerusalem was said to have continued in the apostles' teaching. In other words, the apostolic doesn't mean necessarily that an apostle wrote the book, but that whoever wrote that book, like Matthew or Luke, was associated with an apostle. So it was under the direction of the apostles. Now that word apostle, we're gonna come back to next Shabbat because I'm out of time. This is a good place to break. That was an office in a synagogue, by the way. It's still an office in many Orthodox synagogues today, may I remind you. And when you go to the book of Ephesians, you're going to see that Paul lists out in Ephesians chapter 4 uh, different offices found within the body of Messiah. And it says here in Ephesians 4, uh, verse 11, Furthermore, he gave some people as emissaries, that's Shlachim, or apostles, some as Nevi'im, that's prophets, some as proclaimers of the good news, that's evangelists, some as shepherds, and some as teachers. Your task is to equip God's people for the work of the service that builds the body of the Messiah until we all arrive at unity implied by faith and knowing the Son of God at full manhood at the standard of maturity set by Messiah's profession. In other words, the Shlachim, today there are Shlachim in the Orthodox uh, synagogues that are sent out to different parts of the world to be able to share the message of that particular faith of Judaism. At one time, as I'll be talking about next week, at one time, Judaism was a proselytizing faith. But because of the Gentile church, uh, it stopped doing that. So next, Shabbat, this is a good place to pick it up. We're going to talk about the apostles, the authority of the apostles, and uh, what, they, what their task was. So that's the end of today. There's a lot of information. I will. Uh,